Good evening, my lovelies. Welcome to Lady McCreepster's Night Noise Horror Podcast. I'd like to start off by welcoming the new members of my dark family on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, my dears. As you know, us horror narrators have been struggling a little bit lately, so every little bit really does help. If you too would like to become a member of my dark family, head on over to patreon.com slash ladymacreepster. As a member, you could also be eligible for discounts on my dungeon essentials, what you mortals call merchandise. So once again, go over to patreon.com slash ladymacreepster. Now on with today's tale. This one is by author P.F. McGrail from the book Fifty Shades of Purple and Other Horror Stories. A direct purchase link is in the episode description. So be sure to help support these authors as well, as without them, there would be no stories for me to tell and for you to enjoy. Be warned though, my dears, this one is a tad bit graphic. But if you dare, Come, lean in closer, and we'll begin. My last day as a repo man was February 3rd, 1982. Now I had seen some shit in my day. My line of work didn't exactly reveal the nicer aspects of human nature. I'd been in plenty of fights, seen more guns waved around than I can possibly remember, and nearly lost my left thumb when a doberman bit through the tendon as the deadbeat owner stood by and laughed. I was able to push it all aside until my last day. The call came in to pick up a 20-foot storage container. Larger items, ironically, are usually the easiest. We wouldn't get sent out to pick up something so huge and immobile unless there wasn't likely to be a fight over it. I wish there had been a fight. I wish there had been something. The storage container was locked up tight when we got there. It was pretty obvious that we were going to have to try and open it, then remove what was inside if we had any chance of towing the damn thing. Three of us, me, Mitch and Jim was standing on the top of the container trying to figure out how to get inside. There was a hatch on the top, maybe five feet by five feet, that was padlocked shut in four different places. We got past those easily, but the door was fucking heavy. We decided that Mitch and Jim would flank the sides and pull up, and I would kneel in front of the opening to try and pry it open. It took some straining, but it started to budge. We pulled it open about a foot, and I dropped it back down into place. The smell. Fuck me sideways, the smell. After dropping it down, I pitched forward and nearly vomited, ducking and rolling into the fetal position. I can't possibly describe the odour itself, but the wave of scent was so overpowering that I could feel it ripple across my face. It was so powerful that my other senses had to kick in and absorb it just so that my brain could process it all. I tasted the vomit in my mouth, but forced it back down my throat. No way I was letting the other two see me rich. The job held a certain machoism that was hard won and easily lost. Mitch and Jim didn't seem to care. They were puking over the edge of the container. I realized how strong it must have been to make them upchuck. They were several feet away. That thought, combined with the sounds of their retching, proved too much. That's right, I had eggs this morning. A very distant thought wavered in the back of my feverish mind. Hard-boiled eggs, five of them. Ten exhausting minutes later, we were standing idly on the storage container, wondering what to do. We don't have a choice, guys, I explained. The job is nearly too grand in the end. We come back empty-handed, we might as well not come back at all. Mitch was staring down at his splattered shoes, forlorn as fuck. Jim was just staring vacantly at the horizon, like he was the last man on earth. I suddenly realized what I had just done by being the voice of reason. 
shit. I'll... I choked down a little access vomit. I'll be the first to check it out. It sounded noble in my head, but had trailed off to little more than a whisper when I was finished. And that's how we were back in the original position five minutes later, everyone holding their breath, T-shirts now tied tightly around everyone's faces. In retrospect, I wish I had kept my T-shirt on. I told myself that I would be ready this time, that I was prepared for the smell and that I could do this. I was wrong. We lifted up the hatch again and the odour reared its head like a fucking demon. I don't know how it happened. The next thing that I remember, I was falling. Forward. Into the nastiness. I landed with a squish. I had only fallen down about four feet. The container was mostly full. I was laying on something that was not quite solid and not quite liquid. It was cold and warm. This was what one tiny corner of my brain was processing. The rest was screaming internally at the smell. I tried to stand, but as soon as I gained my footing, the substance seemed to shift. I pitched forward and felt my face get splattered in goop. It got in my ears. Wiping my face was impossible. When I lifted one hand up to my head, the other one sank deep down into the chunks. I tried to move away. I tried to stay still, but no matter what I did, the sludge continued to find a way to sink deeper and deeper down my back, into my socks, soaking my underwear with unholy gravy. I flailed. Mitch and Jim's disgusted faces appeared above me, yelling things incomprehensible. I could not stand rigid enough to reach up to them. Every time I tried to stabilize my footing, the ground shifted again, pitching me either forward on my face or flat on my back. I know I must have vomited, but it was too mixed in with the rest of the horror for me to tell. I fell forward again, and when I landed, I saw a face. A tiny face looking back at me. Just a face, no body. Then I realized that there were many tiny faces and tiny hands, feet and torsos strewn about. All of them detached. All of them tiny. All of them rotten. I was standing on decaying human sludge. My world turned out a little at that point. Mitch and Jim were eventually able to lower a rope down and I clutched with every fiber of my being. After a few more sloppy minutes, they were able to lift me out of that charnel hell. I didn't even put on new clothes when I stormed into my boss's office so that I could tell him to shove the job up his ass. I ran in wearing nothing but human jelly and never came back. Turns out that the owner of the storage container had owned a medical lab that studied human tissue. He had been using aborted fetuses in his research, but lacked the funds for proper disposal. Enter the storage container. He lacked the funds to pay for the container as well. For a smart guy, I guess he didn't think things through very well. I went home that day and showered three times. When I finally felt clean, I went to sleep and did not wake up for 12 hours. I was beginning to feel a little better at that point. I thought that maybe I could put this behind me. Maybe I would eventually be able to eat meat again at some point in my life. I stood, stretched, and tussled my hair. I even smiled. Something fell from my scalp and made a tiny pitter-patter when it hit the floor. Without thinking, I bent over and picked it up. Sitting in my palm, no bigger than a dime, was a tiny human hand. I've been a vegetarian ever since. I did warn you it was going to be quite graphic. Let me know what you think of that story. Shoot me a message on social media. I'm Lady McCreepster on both Twitter and Facebook. If you're watching this on YouTube, do leave me a comment below. 
That's all I have for you this evening, my dears. Till next time, sweet dreams.